Good day, Jeff. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me on human performance technology, and we're doing this today over Zoom. Hi, Guy. I'm, I'm glad to be here. No, that's not true. I'm actually mad at you. You should have started this series decades ago when I was just starting my practice so I could avoid avoided making all the mistakes that I did. So no, I'm not in a good mood. <laughs> well, thank you, Ben. Hey, for our audience, I just want to give a little background here. Um, this is a very, uh, the day I met you was very memorable for me, not, not just because I met you, of course, so that's part of it, but, uh, but basically this was my first day as a consultant after leaving Motorola, where I spent 18 months, and I had joined my uh, business partner, the owner of the consulting firm, Ray Svensson, the late Ray Svensson now, but uh, he and I flew to Houston on November 1st, 1982, to go do some work with Exxon, uh, one of his clients and soon to become uh, one of my clients. And we uh, uh, did a presentation to the local NSPI, which is now ISPI, but to their local chapter in Houston. And we spoke about job modeling, which today I kind of call performance modeling. So I've been talking and speaking about this for a long time, but that was my very first presentation to a a chapter uh, of any sort or uh, any kind of a, a formal presentation to a professional group. But uh, you were in the audience that day uh, and you came up and talked to, uh, I don't know if you came to talk to me, you probably came up and talked to Ray afterwards, but, uh, but I was in the room there at the front of the stage. Yeah, that was a significant moment in my career. So why would I say that? Because as learning and development professionals, we had always focused on the input side which means designing elegant training. And the reason your presentation stood out from all the others was that you talked about the output, making a difference, performing. And so I, I think many of us that, that learned our trade in the late 70s and early 80s kind of were focused on Sesame Street, where you tried to be clever and you tried to be entertaining rather than move the business needle. And, and that's why I've been following you ever since the early 80s and continue to learn from you. Just keep pushing the output so that we can make a difference with the companies where we work. Of course, many of us, uh, me included, uh, borrowed all of that focus on performance and on worthy outputs from uh, the late Tom Gilbert and his book, uh, 1978 book, Human Competence. And, his business partner from way back, uh, Gary Rumler, who was into all that stuff before he joined up with uh, Tom Gilbert. But uh, Ray Svensson was also very much a performance-oriented person. He was a former Bell Labs engineer, and engineers are always about, you know, form following function and what are the functional requirements and all that stuff that really kind of parallels good instruction or good performance improvement. But let me shift gears here into our series of questions here, which you've had a chance to look at. But for our audience, could you please introduce yourself? And let's start with, uh, where did you grow up? Sure, northern Minnesota, a town of about 13,000 people. And I grew up seeing my dad and his two sisters being small business people. And so we, they ran three different businesses, Gill Brothers Clothing, uh, Gill Shoes Store for Women, and a Universal Cup Price Store. And, the reason I bring that up is they, they gave me a firsthand view into what it's like to set up a, a work culture and how you treat employees. And that has really stayed with me ever since. And so started off at the University of Minnesota in business. Mm -hmm. I graduated uh, three and a half years. That was possible back then. Went right into graduate school and studied uh, human resources and labor relations. And I had the luck of being able to work for the program director, Professor Herbert G. Heineman. And the books are no longer around, but he and Dale Yoder in the 50s and 60s started out the PEAR handbook. And that was personnel administration and industrial relations. And they really helped form HR as a profession. And so later on in our conversation, I'll, I'm sure I'll bring up Dave Ulrich and, and talk about where it was when Heinemann and Yoder were leading the pack and where it is now with uh, Dave Ulrich. 
Hey, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so after college, what did you, where did you go? What, what kind of job did you get? Can you share with us a little bit about uh, your career progression? Sure. So as a baby boomer, I might have done it a little bit different in that I tended to change companies a lot more often than other people. And what that gave me is a chance to work at the plant HR level, the division or re regional level, and then the corporate level. And I worked in many different industries. And I think that gave me a, a very interesting view on how to approach work. Because just between you and me and our audience, whether you're working in an insurance company or you're making automobiles, it doesn't really matter. Human performance is human performance. And then on the other side of that coin, Guy, is I started out as a HR generalist. I moved into total quality management. I worked in the industrial engineering department. I tended to focus on, on training and development, which was my specialty in college. Uh, I studied Kaizen. Uh, I did startups. I did turnarounds. I helped behemoth companies that were over 100 years old make a difference. And so I think all that different melting pot of ideas and experiences led me to the professional that I am. And I use the term professional lightly. So pre-COVID, I was a uh, vice president of learning and talent development at a really cool six-year-old company that was preparing for an IPO and helping them formalize their learning and talent development processes so that uh, they could convince Wall Street that they were a uh, a very serious company and, and took their employees and, and their culture and creating a sense of belonging and purpose seriously. Excellent. So can you uh, share with us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, or what could also be called evidence-based practices for performance improvement or, you know, it's called many different things. But first of all, what do you call this stuff, HPT? So I worked for Clorox for nine years, and they, had, they were in the precipitous environment where they had to be spun off from Procter & Gamble. And they were a one-trick pony. They made Clorox bleach, and that was it. And to be able to survive against the big boys like Procter and Lever and Colgate, they had to rapidly rethink how they did business. And so they were off on a venture of understanding high performance. And so I, I had the luxury of studying under Dave Kosters, who was our, our leader of high performance manufacturing, so that manufacturing did its part and marketing did their part while they were developing the R&D capabilities to, to create all kinds of different products and divisions and on M&A spree. And so they, they acquired Kingsford Charcoal, they acquired Hidden Valley Ranch Salad Dressing Company. And what we were trying to do is say, what makes some companies year after year perform better than everyone else in their competitive space? And I had the luxury of studying a lot of the companies that won the Malcolm F. Baldridge Award. There was a professor here in Texas, and I'll be, for the life of me, I can't remember his name, and, and he had a couple networks, and there were companies from Boeing and, and, and Sherwin-Williams, and we got to study what made their performance sustainable year after year. The difference, however, is they were kind of doing it from the seat of their pants, and what were my practices now, especially after studying the David Rock at the Neural Leadership Institute, is what does the science say works? And so hopefully you can get into that in our discussion. And then I'll just give credit to the teams of where I worked on some of the external awards that we won. So when I was at Coca-Cola, had the fortune of accepting the award for the top 10 best company for leaders. At uh, Sassaw, where I worked for six years, we won the award uh, by the National Society of Black Engineers for HR Partner of the Year. We did that two years in a row. And also here in Houston, we won best place to work for mid-sized companies when I was at Valeris Natural Gas. 
And the one I think was a really coolest is from Waste Management, where we won Corporate U University best, best in class for a new startup university. And what we did there is I pulled together all my colleagues from Halliburton and other places I had worked, and we had a razor sharp focus on how do we improve performance of waste management? It was already good, but we wanted to take it to the next level. And then we competed against over 100 international companies and won uh, second place for how to design a uh, corporate university. And lo and behold, a lot of the principles that we used were, were from where? Things I had learned from you and Ray and, and all the others over the years. So that was a really nice feedback from the external community that what we were doing worked. And of course, made a ton of mistakes along the way. Thank you. Can you share with us uh, what perhaps was your best developmental uh, experience that kind of exemplified an HPT orientation? Sure. So I was reporting to the VP of HR for Kingsford and, and we had both Charcoal and Hidden Valley Ranch. And Jim Burtnett was the VP of HR. And one of my assignments uh, reporting to him was to help with the staffing for the, the division. And we had a, a Hidden Valley Ranch salad dressing food plant in Chicago, as well as a sister plant in Reno, Nevada. And the one in Chicago was kind of a rough plant. About a, year, uh, a couple months before the job was posted for a production manager, um, we had uh, some officers with special badges that come into the plant and our employees that were not quite legal to work in the United States left out the back door. And so that plant was in pretty rough shape. And so I was able to find all kinds of great production manager candidates from Kraft and General Foods. And once they got to the plant, they said, ah, interesting proposition, but I don't think so. So after a couple months of unsuccessfully filling that job. I went to Vern Jackson, the plant manager said, Vern, give me a shot at it. I, I you know, he and I had worked together in, in, in on the Kingsford side and I had helped him out in a number of ca cases. And I remember Vern specifically saying, what the hell, Jeff, no one else wants a job. And two years later, we had turned that plant around and I had made a deal with the employees that if you teach me how to successfully make salad dressing, I will make this the best place to work. And we, we, we made a deal and, and it worked. So let, let's take off a, a layer of the onion. So here I was, HR background, did no squat about production management. And when I started, first couple of weeks, when I started observing what was happening at shift chains, two things really were bizarre. The first thing is, and we were running two 10 hour shifts a day. So after the first nine and a half hours, the second shift crew would start to come in. And the first thing they would do is reset the lines. So the lines were running just fine all day long on A shift. But when B shift crew came in, the mechanics and the operators immediately changed the lines on how they were running. They didn't look at the logbook. They didn't talk to the operators on, on the first shift. They just changed them. And the second thing that was happening throughout the shift is every once in a while, Shabir, who was the QC uh, technician, would walk in, grab a couple packets of dry Hidden Valley Ranch salad dressing mix, go into the lab, and about 15 minutes later, he would come back and he put his thumb up or thumb down. Thumb down meant there was too much weight, lower the weight. Thumb up meant they're too light, they're below spec, raise the weight. And at that point, it dawned on me that something isn't working. We're going by personal preferences. We're going by what an external person is saying about our production and not going by standardization, by creating a, a best practice that works and not deviating it, not understanding when something is heading towards the upper control limit, why is that? Not understanding when it's dropping down to the lower control limit, 
And so right then and there, I said, I'm going to focus my attention on standardizing that and formalizing how we train people. Because the notion of putting your newest person with somebody, you know, good old Joe, who's my most experienced operator, certainly because he's my best operator, he knows how to train that and pass that knowledge on to somebody else. And of course, that didn't make any sense. So it was being completely outside of my comfort zone, not wanting to let Vern and the team down, and just making some observations that something squirrely was going on in operations really helped me understand that it is all about performance. There are better ways and worse ways to train people. And if you can standardize things, it makes it a whole lot easier because nobody wants to spend the whole shift fighting the equipment. They'd much rather have it running smoothly and at production capacity or even higher. And so that really led me into this wonderful world that I call high performance manufacturing. Excellent. Can you uh, share with us uh, who are some of your, as a way to point our audience to people, books, and articles that uh, were influential to you uh, back when you first started, what would you name? What articles and books might uh, you point people to? Sure. So this is going back to the days of Tom Peters, of Marv Weisbord, of Rasabeth Moss Cantor from Harvard, of the book Dynamic Manufacturing by Hayes. Uh, so uh, other Harvard professors that were talking about the learning organization. Edgar Schein, some of the classic people you mentioned, um, Rumler, so Rumler and Brage, Pritchett and Pound, Price and Pound, they wrote all the pamphlets about change management. So I guess I'm sharing a little bit of an eclectic model of borrowing from Kaizen, TQM, where you standardize processes, borrowing from manufacturing engineers, borrowing from HR, borrowing from all those different fields and at the time we were looking at best practices and now we know that that doesn't always work. By touring Malcolm Baldridge award winners and understanding what, the, what was their process before, what is their process now, it's not copying their process now, it's understanding what they learned when they went from state A to state B to state C. That is something I, I think you can borrow rather than just copying. And I think that's where Mock and Bobrich kind of took a left turn and, and, and made some mistakes. It's, it's some of the old training companies like Wilson Learning and DDI and PDI. Unfortunately, the, the latter two are still with us. It's listening to Zanger Miller and just knowing Jack Zanger and Joe Faulkman, just two delightful guys like yourself that just want to share the science behind what they've learned over the decades that makes a difference. And it's not just to make companies a little bit more profitable or shareholders a little bit more wealthy, but it's really creating an environment where people want to come to work, where they can be themselves, they don't have to put on that mask and and be that corporate persona, that's what makes a difference. That's why I've stayed in this side of the, of the fence for all these years, is to make a difference for employees. Well, thanks. So if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you do, what would that be? So it's helping companies build sustainable competitive advantage by doing six things. And this is, again, using neuroscience, brain science on how do you track better talent where employees become productive sooner, they contribute more, they want to stay longer, where they can be themselves, and six, they can work safely. So having spent a lot of my years down in Houston in energy companies, working safety is tantamount. You can't do those other five if you're constantly worried in fear that something's going to blow up or somebody gets hurt. So to me, I would put the order of working safely and then the other five. Excellent. Thank you. 
As a lifelong learner, uh, what's your current focus or next focus for learning? What, what, what are you pursuing? So when we were working on creating the, the learning development organization for waste management, I created a, a concept called three by five. And I believe that a learning invention has, is a three act play and there are at least five actors. And so the, the three act play is that there's a, a before learning, during learning and then after learning. And the problem is, and this is where you and, and, and your peers have been so successful is learning and development primarily focuses on the during learning. And we kind of cross our fingers and hope the supervisor setting up the adult learn to be successful and, and the motivation happens in magic. And that once they're out of our course, we kind of hope that it continues, but don't really know. And, and so that really, um, helped me under crystallize the before, during, and after. And so what I'm trying to do is incorporate the, the brain science into that model. And then, and then the, so that's the, the three act play. And then the five actors are the, the learning and development community, the adult learning, the person's manager, their manager, and either a coach or a facilitator that can keep it going once the, the main event has happened. So what I'm trying to do now is update that model. So if anybody in the audience has some ideas or wants to, to share them with me and, and learn and wrestle over the concepts, I'd be more than happy to do. And then the second thing that I'm focusing on is a, at an energy conference I presented a number of years ago, I talked about the, the, the top three things a, a, a new CLO, Chief Learning Officer, has to do. And I said, you have uh, 180 days to do it. And then my next slide is, I lied. There are 10 things you have to do and you have nine, you have 90 days. And so I listed off those 10 things. And one of them that I learned that was really helpful us at, at Waste Management was a governance board. And we had it made of half the members of the executive committee. So these were all the business VPs and senior VPs, plus a couple high potentials so that they could rub shoulders with, uh, with the executives as well as they were a little bit closer to the work and could really give us some steering that was necessary. So the answer to your question is I'm trying to up update the three by five model as well as what are the, the 10 things you should do as a new CLO. Thanks. So you're, a, you're an author, Are you? can you share with us a little bit about some of your past uh, writings and, and if you're working on anything new? At Sasol Petrochemicals, so their North American headquarters is here in Houston, they were engaged in one of the world's largest capital construction projects in Lake Charles, Louisiana. So it was a $13 billion chemical complex expansion. The current plant was built in the 1960s and had seven chemical units on it or seven chemical plants. They were very successful. And ever since the, the late seventies, they were just humming along. And because they were so profitable, Sasol based in, in South Africa decided to expand their, their footprint in North America and gave the nod to that plant. And so for six years from 2013 to middle of 2019, I drove to Lake Charles almost every week and focused on how to hire and how to train and qualify the operators for the new $13 billion construction site. And so from that, I was able to create some presentations and obviously it was with uh, the hard work from everybody on the teams and just share some of the things that we're learning. And so there are a couple of networks, especially here in the area that focus on the energy industry and they're represented by the top 150 oil and gas companies around the world and the service companies. And just, it's a wonderful exchange of ideas and you don't present it so much as the expert as, this is what we're doing. Come help us take it to the next level. And that's what I liked about that network. 
And so a lot of my writings has to have to do with that experience gained from making sure that we were ready for a startup for that rather large chemical plant expansion. Thank you. Let's uh, go back and explore a little bit more about some of the people who influenced you. And uh, uh, you, you've mentioned some names, so it's not necessary to cover those again, but if there are anybody that you'd like to do a shout out to, a uh, professor in the past, coworkers, other people in the business who uh, you have borrowed from, as we all have borrowed from so many others. Uh, so you, you can't have this, con sorry, Pardon? you can't have this conversation without talking about Dave Ulrich. Okay. And I just read this morning that they're getting ready to do their eighth in a series of longitudinal studies on what makes for an HR professional and, and the competencies. And, and what's nice about that is his model has changed over the years significantly because he is willing to be open. He's willing to admit they made a mistake. He's willing to admit that things have changed. And so I've been fortunate to be an ad advisory board member to the University of Houston, their HR development program at the master's degree level. And a couple of years ago, Professor Consuelo Waite asked me if, if I would support from the business side, if they made it also a bachelor's degree program. And of course I did. Uh, at at Waste and, and subsequent companies, I've been able to hire a bunch of them. I actually left Waste Management to join Room when I followed my high potential who had graduated from that program. The funny thing is that I worked with her mother at Waste Management. She had a PhD in instruction technology from the University of Southern California. So even though it's a huge country and world working with colleagues, over the years in different capacities has always been fun. And then another part of my answer is that, and, and so why do I keep up bringing up Neural Leadership Institute and, and David Rock and David Eagleman last week, watched a video on him uh, talking about his new book on what they understand now about the, the brain versus two years ago when he left Houston, hate him for that. and. And it's all about understanding what really makes a difference versus HR gut feel. So here's how I apply that recently. Let's go all the way back to March when COVID was just starting to become more serious of a, of a pandemic. So the v, VP of HR asked me to pull together a quick pulse survey. And so the first thing I did was go do some research and then what, where I landed was looking at the Gallup organization. And they had also done a longitudinal study on what do employees need from their companies during a crisis. And it didn't matter what country, what type of crisis, but over the decades, people wanted four things. The first one is to know that leadership has a plan. The second thing is to hear on a regular basis from their supervisor, the person that means most of them, what's going on, especially when the supervisor says, I don't know, but I will find out. The third, people, third thing people want during the crisis is to have the, the tools that they need to be productive, especially when on a Friday they go home and on a Monday they find out they're working from home for N months, if not forever. And then the fourth thing is that the company cares about their well-being. So study that, shared that with a couple of business leaders. They, they agreed, they liked it. And when I shared it with the HR community, it got a little bit of pushback. And what they wanted to do was turn it into an employee engagement survey. And soon those four questions ballooned to 50. And I said, not gonna work. This isn't that type of, of an initiative. This is to find out quickly, are we meeting the needs of our employees during the early weeks of COVID? So I said, yes, I like one of your questions. And we added a fifth one that says, as a result of this survey, I believe management will take action. So we administered that in late March and, and in April. And I'm happy to say that we scored at 90% or higher on all five questions. And that told us in leadership that we were doing the right things. And of course we had an open dialogue box and people gave us a whole bunch of suggestions because 
they were not comfortable working with the public. They were not comfortable buying and selling cars and being inside them from, from, um, from the car seller. And so we took that feedback, incorporated that, and we were considered a, a essential organization. And by having the courage to say no, because the science backed it up, kept that down to five questions and, and it worked. And so that's why I keep bringing up the, the Neural Leadership Institute, David Rock, David Eagleman and, and others that I think complement the work that you're doing quite nicely. Thank you. Jeff, uh, the, uh, beginning our wrap up here, can you uh, uh, share with us any parting words of wisdom or guidance you might have for our audience, especially the people com coming into the field, new to the field, uh, related to all things performance improvement wise, what guidance would you give new people? Sure. So the first example, Guy, is that my wife is a librarian and she is a little bit on the side of the scale where these are my books and don't get them dirty and if you check them out, I want to make sure in the same exact perfect condition when you return them as, as you checked out. And unfortunately, learning and development communities have tended to act like this. And so my first piece of advice is democratize learning and development. Don't own and control it 100%. Sometimes it's better to have a homemade, smarmy, three-minute video with all kinds of mistakes in it that are developed by your employees than a perfect video designed by the L&D community that took eight months and was 50% over budget. So the second one is back to that governance board that I suggested is have your constituents, the users of your output, give you input on what they need, what they like, what they don't like, and be prepared to say no when you say, well, the behavioral science doesn't support that. Another piece of advice is when we were building this, this massive plant in Lake Charles, Louisiana, I had a choice to make. I can hire a whole bunch of trainers that can read the script and deliver it to the new employees as we were constructing the units, or option B is hire a bunch of instructional designers and have them work with the, the design engineers and the supervisors and have the supervisors be in the structures. And so we chose B. So the supervisors led all the training and of course behind the scenes, we, we did all the things to help them understand the, how adults learn and how to manage the classroom. But that was secondary. The main thing is that if your supervisor understands the chemistry of what's happening in the units, so will the employees. And if you design assessments that guarantee they understand the chemistry of the units rather than if it's creeping up toward the UCL, I turn this dial. I don't know why I turn that dial, but I know I should turn it down from six to 7.4. If they understand the chemistry, what's happening in that unit, when it's four in the morning and something is going out of control, the employees know what to do and they understand it rather than, gee, it's, it's turning up, let me turn the dial down. Uh, another piece of advice is do not, under any circumstances, call yourself an L&D partner. This term from HR community of an HR business partner is, I think, silly. I don't know of a marketing partner. I don't know of, an, of a legal partner. I don't know of a health, safety, and environmental partner. Why do we do that? If you really want to earn a seat at the table, add value, move the business needle. And then the last piece of advice that I'll offer is that constantly reinvent yourself. So figure out what is the production manager job you should take so that you can be in the shoes of your customers. So if you decide to go back to learning and development or whatever it's called in your organization, you really understand the business and can make recommendations 
based on experience rather than guess. So that's my advice to some of the, the newbies in the field. And it's a great career. It, it's extremely satisfying when you see people that have this level of capability and then after the intervention, they have this level. That's why I'm in it. I agree so much. Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your, your time with us today and uh, participating in this video interview. Good luck to you guys going forward. Cheers. Absolutely. It's been fun to reconnect with you since way back in 1982, Guy. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye. Sure.